Such an awesome God, so mighty, so holy, so wonderful. Such an awesome God, so selfless, so generous, so Good morning, CLC. Glad to have you here this morning. And those of you that are joining us online, uh, we are singing a song in intro, Such an Awesome God. We're going to be singing that during our worship set. It's a newer song for us here. So we thought we'd uh, sing it for you before we got to sing it together. But we're so glad that you're with us today. Um, we have some announcements, and so I'm going to have you uh, keep your eye on the screens. And uh, here you go. Welcome. We are glad you are with us today at CLC. If you're new with us, please fill out the connection card that's in your bulletin. Or if you are online, you can fill out our online connection card. Just go to our website at clcwhitefish.org and click the Welcome tab. There are many ways to find out what is happening throughout the week here at CLC. 
First, your bulletin is loaded with helpful information, but we also have other ways, like our website, our weekly email updates, and our new church app. You can download the app by going to the Google Play Store or App Store and type in CLC Whitefish in the search bar. Make sure you turn your notifications on so that you can get the latest updates. Also, please like and follow us on Facebook and YouTube. Hey, Christ Lutheran Church, we have a new church app, and it's time for you to get it. You go to the App Store if you have an Apple phone, and you go to the Google Play Store if you have a Google phone. When you touch on the App Store or the Google Play Store, it's going to have a search bar at the top. You want to type in CLC space Whitefish, but by the time you get to the W, it knows CLC Whitefish, second one down. Then you're going to want to download it. Now, before I click download, I want you to know that some of you are going to need to have your Apple account information or your Google account information so that you can get the app once you hit the download button. Once the app is downloaded, all you're going to have to do is hit the open button. Once the open button is selected, it's going to ask us to send push notifications. You want to definitely set allow push notifications. It's going to ask you what kind of notifications services, events, kids, youth, men's ministries, women's ministries, or life groups. Hit the next button. Now, because many of your profiles are already in our system, when you hit sign up, all you're going to have to do is type in your phone number and hit send, and then it's going to send you a code. This is a way to secure the account so that you know that this is a secure connection now that you have the app, you can feel free to peruse the app and see all of the incredible features. For more information, or if you need help downloading the app, please contact the church office or stop by the office during normal business hours. We'd love to help you get connected on the church app. Awesome. Well, it is a great way to connect. And I noticed that we have 65 members that have already signed up for the app. So that's fantastic. Um, the more of you that get on that app, the better it will be for us to connect with one another and connect with you as new information comes out. Would you stand up? We are going to um, have our confession this morning. We're gathered here today to worship our Lord in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and comfort, come and save us. Turn us away from our sins to live for you alone. Give us the power of your word that we may confess our sins, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, the head of the church throughout the world. Amen. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and of each other. Gracious God, have mercy on us. In your compassion, forgive us our sins known and unknown, things done and left undone. Show us a new path by your Spirit so that we may live and serve you as your church to the honor and glory of your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy on us. God has given his only Son to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in his name, he gives the power to become the children of God and to grow faithfully as his church. Amen. Let's just take a moment to pray. Father God, thank you so much that we can come together uh, to worship you, to worship you through music, through, to worship you through confession, to worship you, you through giving, uh, the reason we're here is to have community and to have community with you. And you meet us here in this church. And we're so grateful for that. I just pray for all the churches of the Flathead Valley right now that they would be met by you. They can experience you in a new and fresh way because I know that you are so excited to meet with us today. May we worship you in spirit and in truth. We ask in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. Well, we're going to raise a hallelujah this morning. Join me in singing. I raise a hallelujah. 
in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. song where the men follow me and the women follow my sister, Pamela. Here we go. Sing a little louder. 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 a newer song. We've only sung it once here, but it has an amazing chorus and it'll be easy for you guys to catch.
together. Nothing comes close to the Lord Almighty. Nothing as sweet as His love and mercy. Nothing comes close to the Lord Almighty. Nothing as sweet as His love and mercy. Yeah. 
such an awesome God. Where do you need to be reminded today that the God who is so great and so awesome can show up in that impossible circumstance? Would you declare that as we sing this one more time? Such an awesome God. So children's message, I'm guessing? All right. Yes, there you go. <laughs> well, come on up, kids. I hope there's a couple of you. If not, I do have a backup plan. <laughs> Being a very old educator, you always have a backup plan. Well, good morning to you all. Wow. Summer is truly here, wouldn't you say? I was up at Ashley Lake yesterday, and the water's 73 degrees, and I think it'll hit 75 today, and that's lovely. Okay, today we're going to talk about being thankful. Do you know what that means, being thankful? Did you kind of study that in vacation Bible school at all, or...? You know, sometimes we give thanks for food, right? So, can you tell me what you might be thankful for? There's, there's probably a million things. What are you thankful for? My family. Your family. That is a terrific answer. How about you? My family. Your family. That's, that's terrific. And you, young lady? My family. Wow. <laughs> that's a hat trick. And how about you? My dogs. Your dogs? Okay, I'm going to scoot over here just a little closer to you. So, what are your dogs' names? Coco and Rosie. And what kind of dogs are they? Black Labs. Oh, I like Black Labs. I have a little white English setter. Her name is Nellie. She's nervous, Nellie. Naughty Nellie, and whoa, Nellie. <laughs> and the whoa is when we're hunting because she hunts, she hunts pheasants. Well, for myself, um, I'm thankful for many things. Something that I am thankful for is God. A few years ago, I had some health issues, and throughout the various treatments and medicines and all of that I was never alone I never felt alone and that was because God the Father God the Son and God the Holy Spirit were always with me in addition to that um, a close friend of mine in this church shared with me that while I was away at the Mayo Clinic that Many members of this church had prayed for me, and I could truly feel that, and I was humbled and very thankful for that. But sometimes we forget all that God has given us, and we want more and more and more. We need to train ourselves to be thankful for what we have, to be thankful for our family, our family and your two dogs. <laughs> Let's pray. Dear Triune God, thank you all for what you have given us. Help us to show gratitude for all these gifts. 
Help us to be content with the blessings which you so generously give us and help us to be on guard against selfishness and greed. In Jesus' name we pray and we always say, Thank you. All right. Well, let's now all greet one another. Please do it nicely. Well, good morning. Uh, Karen, where, where are you, Karen? There she is. Karen is going to be our reader. She has selflessly volunteered to do that for us, which I'm thankful for. So go ahead and lead us away, Karen. <clears throat> our first scripture reading is from 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 10 through 13. David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, O Lord, God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor, for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our, now our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. Please stand. Our next reading is from the Gospel of John. Chapter 17, verses 20 to 23. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. You may be seated, please. Amen. Thank you, Karen. Well, good morning. Glad that you are here. Uh, as many of you in this room, I know quite a few of you, were at the service for Dwayne Carlson yesterday. Um, and we're thankful that we got that opportunity to grieve and to also rejoice that Dwayne is now in heaven with our Lord. Um, and I just wanted to say that I am filled with nothing but gratitude after that service and that day. Um, the way that our staff, the way that volunteers, everybody just banded together um, and said, yes, let's do this. Um, so I am so thankful for this church. 
Um, there are many servants here, willing servants, people who give of their time, their energy, and their love to serve other people in our Christ Lutheran Church family, uh, which included the Carlsons and the other side, Kathleen's side, the Suttons. Um, so thank you. Just thank you for everything. Uh, my heart is full um, after yesterday, and, and to just work alongside all of you. Um, so thank you. That's what the body does, um, and that was a beautiful example. Um, so let's get into it. I might not be as peppy as usual. Uh, I'm not usually described as peppy, I guess, but <laughs> we made it through. I was talking to Kathleen as she came in. We both looked at each other. We're like, we made it through. Okay. So uh, we're going to have a little bit of fun, of course. Um, I remember a pastor once said that the gospel makes the uncomfortable comfortable and the comfortable uncomfortable. So we might be testing that theory a little bit today. And of course, you got to leave it to the Apostle Paul to give us words that challenge and encourage at the same time. He didn't pull any punches in many of his letters, uh, in Ephesians included, which we've been working through. Of course, we know that the Lord is speaking through Paul, like all of Scripture. So when we encounter hard passages like today's, it reminds us to maybe sit up a little straighter and pay attention to what God is saying. And please know that whatever I speak today, even if it's hard, it comes from a place of love for God and his church. I read an article in Christianity, Christianity Today. I will stumble a little bit today with my pronunciations. Apologies. I read an article in Christianity Today about a year ago that fits the concerns of Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, which is our passage for today. It was uh, from a pastor who found himself in the middle of a church split. Pastor Emmett, pastor after much beloved Pastor Doug had retired from decades of faithful service to Grace Fellowship. Pastor Emmett had been serving as the adult education pastor for several years when the transition happened. At first, everyone was overjoyed at the smooth transition. The future was bright, and Pastor Emmett was well-loved and well-respected, but things slowly began to shift. You see, there were people in the church who didn't care for Emmett, and some were prominent members. These prominent members felt their power was in jeopardy now that Pastor Doug had retired. As Pastor Emmett put it, these people felt their membership, relationship to the founder, or financial means gave them some sort of carte blanche in exerting control in the church. And exerting control and power is exactly what they did. At every turn, they undermined Pastor Emmett's leadership. Not because of any biblical or theological issues, mind you, but because they didn't want to lose their influence. And the result was a church that was torn apart. And from what I can tell, Pastor Emmett only lasted five years as senior pastor because of this intense division. When you read his story, it sounds like he's pastoring two congregations in one church building. And sadly, Pastor Emmett does not stand alone in this experience. The worst part of it is the self-inflicted damage the church deals with in these circumstances. Disunity in the church is one of the gravest threats to its health, existence, and growth. And I'm sure to no one's surprise, the Apostle Paul was very aware of this issue. So we'll be looking again at Ephesians 2, 11 through 22 today. At the core of this passage is the non-negotiable essential of unity in the church. And this unity, it's not superficial. It's not a, you have your space, I have mine. No, this unity flows from the unity we have with Christ, which gives us the strength to have meaningful fellowship, and dare I say, to have healthy disagreements in a spirit of love. Now, if you hear nothing else from me today, which would be understandable, Please hear this one big idea. Paul is saying, we are united in Christ to bring glory to God. Our unity in Christ is not about getting everything we want, always getting our way, or as Pastor Emmett said it, having carte blanche and exerting power in the church. As we learned last week, by grace through faith, we are joined together as God's people. In this unity, the incomparable riches of God's grace are displayed. And as Paul will teach us today, God builds us together as his holy temple, a dwelling place for God, filled with praise and glory for him. 
Now, before we jump into the text, I'm going to take us on what I'm going to call a helpful history journey. Uh, I have not tried to patent that. Don't worry. Some of this I have covered before briefly in the series, but it's worth revisiting. Ephesus was the most important city in Western Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. It had a harbor that opened up into the Kester River, which in turn emptied into the Aegean Sea. Because it was an intersection of major trade routes, Ephesus became a commercial center. It boasted a pagan temple dedicated to the Greek goddess Artemis, which Paul did get into some deep water with in Acts 19, 23 through 41. Knowing the huge evangelistic opportunity, Paul made Ephesus his center for evangelism for about three years. Ephesus was a majorly important mission field to the early church. The Ephesians, the Ephesian church was actually considered a model church. It wasn't filled with a bunch of corrections of errors like we see in Romans or Corinthians. It's not perfect, of course, but there's less conflict than other churches. With Paul and Timothy ministering, three years, they hadn't fallen into some of the same traps as other churches. And if they had, Paul and Timothy, Timothy could correct them quickly. So scholars actually see this letter to the Ephesians more like a catechism. If someone was new to the church, you'd hand them this, much like we have a catechism in the Lutheran church. And Paul, at the writing of Ephesians, of course, is in jail, which is his favorite thing to be in, uh, <laughs> facing probably certain death. So the question that came to my mind when I think about that is, why did Paul feel the need to write this catechism-style letter to such a well-taught church, especially if his time is limited? One scholar gave a perfect answer to this. He said, Now is the time for the student to reflect on the overarching purpose of the teaching, becoming a church created in Christ Jesus and in the glory of God. Like any good teacher... Paul knows the most dangerous pitfalls. The church being divided is at the top of that list. So his parting remarks are aimed at giving the Ephesians a vision of what it looks like to be a mature church in Christ, what it means to be united in Christ. With other churches, Paul's teaching was reactive to a particular issue. With Ephesus, he's being more proactive, getting ahead of potential conflict. And like any good navigator, he wants to avoid the storms of division because they not only divide us, but they take away from the mission of the gospel. And that is the concern underlying his words in Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. So let's turn to Ephesians 2 and start with verses 11 through 12. Therefore, which we'll talk about, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. Point one, sin leads to division. If we just read verses 11 through 12, we could miss the larger point that Paul is making. Like we talked about several times during the Philippians series, when you see the word therefore, it is taking everything that was previously stated and making a new argument. Back in verse 3, he says, All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. All of us. Paul is saying Jews, Gentiles, all of us. Gratifying the cravings of our flesh means our sinful nature and all the ways it comes to life. Paul is saying we are all in this together. None of us can call ourselves special or holy by our own effort. No one gets a pass. And that would have been a provocative statement by Paul to first century Jewish Christians. Sure, they realized their sin, but it wasn't like the sin of the Gentiles. They failed to live up to the covenant, but they weren't depraved like those heathen Gentiles. They would probably say to Paul, we're not part of the them in your statement, Paul. And Paul replies, yeah, nice try. We absolutely were depraved like those Gentiles. And all of us here today, we also followed the cravings of the flesh, our sinful nature, the me-centric mentality. And circumcision 
for the Jews was a significant point of pride, which is why Paul mentions it in verse 11. It was the mark that they were God's covenant people, which started back with Abraham. They were set apart as God's representatives to the world. On the other hand, the Gentiles, they were not the children of the promise. They were foreign heathens excluded from Israel. So you can imagine what it was like when these uncircumcised Gentile heathens suddenly start showing up and saying they are children of God. It was a recipe for conflict because many Jewish Christians still believed that Gentiles needed to convert to Judaism before they could accept Jesus. And Paul rejects this in verses 8 through 10 when he makes it clear that everybody can only be saved by grace through faith. All of us, no matter who we are, are only saved by grace through faith. None of us can claim otherwise, meaning we can't claim superiority over anyone else. We are all equal in the eyes of grace. And we no longer live at the mercy of our sinful human nature, but at the mercy of God. And what bound us has been broken, and we are now bound to Christ. When we get to the therefore of verse 11, Paul is using this reconciliation and unification with Christ as the reason we can be reconciled and unified with one another. Sin will take our differences and produce division. Christ takes our differences and produces a family. Andy Stanley, who is a famous author and pastor, has a story that demonstrates how these debatable differences can undercut our unity in Christ and the mission to bring God glory. This is how Andy shares his story in his book, Deep and Wide. When I was 26 years old, I convinced the deacons at my dad's church to let me host a citywide evangelistic event for teenagers. They were on the edge of their seat as I explained my plans. They loved my idea of asking other churches in the area to bring kids from their student ministries to this one-night event. Everybody thought the event was a great idea until they experienced it. They stood around the back of the sanctuary while 2,000 somewhat rowdy teenagers were not entertained by a choir or orchestra. As they described it later, it was irreverent and unruly. They were disturbed by what they saw taking place on the very spot where God's word is preached every Sunday. As one gentleman put it, that's not who we are. I looked at the gentleman who made that comment and asked, did you see the close to 200 kids who came forward to pray with a counselor and give their lives to Christ? I'll never forget his response. You could have done it without that music. 200 students, 200 students confessed faith in Jesus Christ. Despite that, there was a lack of celebration and unification because according to one of the deacons, that's just not who we are. When our preferences trump the proclamation of the gospel, we have lost our way. When our church culture becomes our Christ, we have lost our way. When our liturgy, traditional or contemporary, becomes our Lord, we've lost our way. Paul is saying to the Ephesians, being a circumcised Jew or uncircumcised Gentile does not matter. What matters is that your true identity is found in Christ alone. So I want to ask all of us the hard questions in light of Andy's story and Paul's words. How much are we willing to sacrifice for the proclamation of the gospel? How willing are we to set aside our preferences for the sake of being brothers and sisters united in Christ, bringing glory to God? How committed are we to being a body of believers, not a be a, rather than believers who gather as a body? There is a difference to that. These are challenging questions for all of us, myself included, and we're going to need serious divine help to answer them. And thankfully, as is always the case with Scripture, we have it. So let's turn to verses 13 through 18. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, 
who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Point two, reconciliation leads to unification. There is no gap so wide that the cross can't cover it. I'll say it again. There is no gap so wide that the cross can't cover it. In the cross, we were reconciled to God. In the cross, we received the peace of Christ. In the cross, the barrier of hostility is destroyed. In the cross, enemies become siblings. In the cross, we receive access to the Father by one spirit. In the cross, we have salvation and the forgiveness of sins. In the cross, we have eternal life spent glorifying God. At the center of our unity, is the cross of Jesus Christ. We do have mountains of preferences. We'll even debate and argue over those preferences, but they all disappear in the shadow of the cross. And hear me clearly. Our traditions, our liturgy, our church culture, they are important, but they are never more important than the cross. Because when the cross truly grasps our hearts, our minds, our souls, Nothing can hold a candle to its majesty. And that is what I want to invite all of us to do today. I want all of us to take a second and look at the cross. Take all those things which can divide us, that cause hostility, that attempt to drive a wedge in our unity, that wish to destroy our fellowship. No matter how big or small they are, take those things and put them up against the cross. And we're going to sit in silence for just a few seconds, and I want you to reflect on how the cross responds to those differences. Is the cross enough? Is it enough to give us the strength to place the proclamation over our preferences? Is it enough to unite us in Christ to bring glory to God? It absolutely is. In 1992, Joe Avila killed Amy Wall in a drunk driving accident. After the accident, Joe fled the scene when he came to, he was being booked for second-degree murder at the Fresno County Jail. Just before Easter of 1993, Joe entered the courthouse and pleaded guilty. He was sentenced to 12 years in prison. During this time, he became a believer and began serving the prison's hospice patients and preaching the gospel. After his release, Joe became deeply involved at his local church. Not long after, Joe's mentor called and said that Rick Wall, Amy's father, wanted to see Joe. Rick had been watching Joe's progress from a distance. When they met, Rick told Joe that there were two times a year that he would visit his daughter's grave, on her birthday and on the anniversary of her death. And then Rick said, Joe, I know what you've been doing for a long time now, even when you were in prison. And I approve of it. Joe's prayers for reconciliation were starting to be answered. Joe admitted it was painful to seek forgiveness from the Wall family, but he knew God could use the situation for his glory. Later, Joe and Derek, Amy's brother, were asked to participate in a restorative justice council event in front of hundreds of people. The night of the event, Amy's father approached Joe, hugged him, and said, I love you, Joe. Trying to contain his emotions, Joe shared, I killed his daughter. He 
he was able to give me a hug and say, I love you. And that is the true testament to the miracle of reconciliation and why Christ died on the cross. So I'll ask us all again, is the cross enough? If Christ can reconcile and unite a murderer in the victim's family, then there is no limit to the power of the cross. And this power is what unites us, bringing us together as children of God. It destroys all barriers that cause hostility. It reconciles us by the Holy Spirit when we find ourselves completely at odds with each other. And the results are amazing when this happens. It brings glory to God. Let's finish today's passage with Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Point three. Unification leads to glorification. We were all sinners in need of a Savior. We have that Savior because of God's abundant mercy towards us. Though we were once excluded outsiders, we have been brought in and united with Christ. And this same power unites us with one another. Consequently, we are brothers and sisters, fellow citizens, held together by the cornerstone of Christ to be a holy temple of the Lord. And what is the main function of a holy temple? To praise and proclaim the glory of God. All that has happened, our adoption by the Father, our redemption by the Son, our sustaining by the Holy Spirit. It is also we are set apart as God's people, his holy temple, to praise and proclaim him in all we do. And when I sit and reflect on all of this, Suddenly, the way that I want things doesn't matter as much anymore. In fact, I begin to realize that at some points and sometimes that what I want might be undermining the amazing things God is doing. When we are united in Christ, you no longer appear to me as someone I might disagree on with politics or liturgy or dress or tattoos, <laughs> tradition or music. Instead, when I think of you, those barriers are now gone by the power of Jesus. And when I look at you, I see a brother. And when I look at you, I see a sister. And I no longer look at our differences with apprehension, but with appreciation. And some people I know think that I'm foolish because I don't believe God made a mistake when he formed the church, his body. The church has had turbulent times throughout all history, but it's never been a mistake on God's part. And I desire so deeply for this church and all churches in this world to be places that praise and proclaim the glory of God. That we can move past a culture of preferences for the sake of proclaiming the gospel. Because when we look at all the amazing work of God, the story becomes far more important than any of us and what we want. Paul has reminded us today that we were once far away, but now we are near. We were once without God, but now we have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We were once enemies, but now we are siblings. We were once in hostility, but now we are at peace. We were once two, but now we are one. We were once foreigners, but now we are fellow citizens. We were once homeless, but now we are part of the household. We were once rubble, but now we are God's temple. We were once separate, but now we are unified. God did all of this for us. He did it for you, and he did it for me. Out of his love and his mercy, he has brought us together and unified us. So let us never forget, in the midst of all the potential divisions, what the ultimate truth is. We are united in Christ to bring glory to God. Let's pray. 
God, thank you for your mercy, your love, and your goodness towards us. Thank you that you forgive our sins day in and day out by the work you did on the cross and by defeating the grave. Thank you for bringing us together as a body, not just believers who gather as one, but a true body that's held together on the cornerstone of Christ. And Lord, we thank you again for the life of Dwayne Carlson, one of our brothers who has passed on to be with you. We rejoice that he now has eternal life, but we grieve that he isn't with us. Thank you for him. Thank you for all my brothers and sisters in this room. May we be unified to praise and proclaim who you are to this valley, to this state, to this country, to this world, so that your kingdom may come and your will may be done. Be with us. We love you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. As we enter into a time of offering, I would love for us to prepare ourselves by praying the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hey. 
receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand. All right, we're going to sing uh, our theme song for this series in Ephesians. It's called Bind Us Together, and we've only sang it one time before, so um, hopefully some of the folks that have sung this in years past, we'll be able to help you along with it. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together with love. There is only one God, there is only one King, there is only one body that why we can sing bind us bind us together lord bind us together with cords that cannot be broken bind us together lord bind us together lord bind us together with love Made for the glory of God, purchased by His precious Son, born with the right to be clean, for Jesus the victory is won. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together with love. You are the family of God. Are the promise divine. You are God's chosen desire. You are the glorious new wine. Bind us together. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together with love. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with love. That will be our prayer. Amen. Well, let's shine the light of Christ throughout this Flathead Valley this week, and we will see you next week. Thanks for coming. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be.
be broken. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together with love. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together with love.